Hello and welcome to the Seattle Children's Hospital and a Kleiss boardroom. I'm Mike Asti, the Medical Director of Labs at Seattle Children's Hospital. Today's webinar title is Deletions and Duplications, Why They're Important and How to Get the Most Accurate Results for Your Patients. Our presenter today is Diane J. Allingham Hawkins, Laboratory Director, Prevention Genetics, Marshfield, Wisconsin. We thank Dr. Allingham Hawkins for being with us today. We'd like to acknowledge our partner, Medical Training Solutions. The Seattle Children's Hospital Lab webinar series is available for free for all Medical Training Solutions subscribers until the renewal period upon renewal of the series called the Lecture Library will be available for purchase for a small fee. I'd like to remind everyone that today's program is accredited for PACE credited by Medical Training Solutions. You should have received the info to collect PACE credit for the webinar. If not, feel free to email Megan Hinch at MPS and she can forward them to you. Please note that today we're not going to take questions over the phone. If you'd like to ask us a question, submit it via the Q&A dialog box in the bottom right of your screen. You can ask a question anytime during the event. We won't ask answer questions, however, till the end. Let's get started. Dr. Diane Allingham Hawkins is a laboratory director at Prevention Genetics LLC in Marshfield, Wisconsin. She is dual certified in molecular genetics and cytogenetics by the Canadian College of Medical Geneticists. She completed her postdoctoral fellowship in molecular genetics at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Prior to joining Prevention Genetics earlier this year, Dr. Allingham Hawkins was a private genetics laboratory consultant and senior director of genetic test evaluation and technical editing at Hayes Incorporated. Dr. Allingham Hawkins, please take it away. Thank you very much and thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction. And good afternoon, uh, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, let me just start by talking about the uh, learning objectives of this webinar. So by the end of the webinar, the goal is for all of you to be able to explain the importance of testing for deletions and duplications in your patients with genetic disease, discuss several different methods of testing for deletions and duplications, and describe some of the benefits and limitations of each method as they relate to the clinical validity and clinical utility of the test. Here's a very brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'll just briefly introduce the topic of deletions and duplications, talk a little bit about incidents, and to describe some of the methods of detection that are currently used clinically. Um, and then I'm going to spend a bulk of my time on some case studies just to illustrate the benefit of uh, using this kind of testing. And then there will, excuse me, there will be time for questions and answers at the end. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as what I'm, I'm talking about here, I'll just spend a few minutes talking about the different types of uh, deletions and duplications. You may be familiar with the term indel. Um, this is used to refer to an insertion or a deletion or a combination of the two um, of bases within a, a DNA sequence. The name is actually a contraction of the words insertion and deletion. This typically refers to one or a few bases of, uh, of DNA rather than larger rearrangements. And typically, these can be detected by sequencing. So this is an example of an indel um, that we've detected in our lab. You can see in the forward and the reverse direction, there is a frame shift that occurs. This is because you're um, sequencing, of course, two copies of the gene whenever you're sequencing a region, and one of them has a deletion of an A and a T and an insertion of a C at this position right here, which leads to the frame shift. And you can see it clearly in either direction. So a deletion removes a part of the DNA. It can refer to a few bases as, it, as with an indel, or it can refer to multiple exons or a whole gene or multiple genes. Um, it may alter the protein if it occurs within a gene. And if the whole gene is deleted or affected in such a way that it prevents uh, the protein being made, this can lead to haploinsufficiency, which is loss of half the protein product. And whether or not this actually causes disease depends on how the disease is inherited and the types of variants that are typically seen associated with that disease. 
So this is an example of a very large deletion that would be uh, cytogenetically visible with uh, this piece of the chromosome being removed and the ends being joined back together. Most deletions are not cytogenetically visible and do require another method of detection. A duplication is essentially the reverse of a deletion. Instead of removing a portion of the DNA, a second copy is made. It can also range from a few bases to whole genes or several genes, and again, may alter the protein if it occurs within a gene. If the whole gene is duplicated, this can lead to a triplosufficiency, which is the addition of 50% more of the protein. Um, and again, whether or not this causes disease really depends on the disorder, how it's inherited, and the types of variants that might cause the disease. So again, this is a large piece of, of the chromosome that has been duplicated here and inserted immediately beside. Um, and we probably would be able to see this cytogenetically, but again, most duplications are below the level of typical cytogenetic analysis, and we require a higher resolution to detect them. And then finally, a contiguous gene syndrome is a disorder that is caused by deletion or duplication of several genes that are located next to each other um, on a chromosome. And some common examples include Williams syndrome, which is caused by a 1.5 to 1.8 megabase deletion on the long arm of chromosome 7, and Prader-Willi-Angelman syndrome, which can be caused by deletions on the long arm of chromosome 15. So this is a schematic of the Prader-Willi syndrome, Angelman syndrome region on chromosome 15. And these are two very different disorders that are caused by um, both caused by a contiguous gene syndrome, uh, it's contiguous gene deletion on chromosome 15. So an interesting feature of these disorders is it depends on the parent of origin from whom the deleted chromosome is inherited. So deletions on the paternally inherited uh, chromosome lead to Prader-Willi syndrome, which is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by hypotonia, obesity, intellectual disability, and short stature. But conversely, uh, Angelman syndrome is caused by deletions on the maternally inherited 15. Um, and this is a distinct neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by seizures, several speech and language delays, movement and balance disorder, and intellectual disability. And the reason for this discrepancy is preferential expression of genes in the Prader-Willi region from the paternal chromosome and of genes in the Angelman region from the maternal chromosome. And this is an example of imprinting. So with that very brief uh, introduction, let's talk a little bit about the incidence of deletions and duplications in different disorders. And these can vary widely between genes and between disorders. So for example, in spinal muscular atrophy, more than 95% of cases are caused by a deletion, a homozygous deletion of exon 7 in the SMN1 gene. Similarly, uh, in the shock gene, approximately 70 to 75% of cases of shocks related haploinsufficiency disorder are caused by deletions in this gene. And in Duchenne, and Becker muscular dystrophies uh, in the, on the order of 70, 75% of cases are caused by deletions or duplications in the DMD gene. So in these cases, with these three genes and these three um, sets of disorders, it makes sense to start with deletion and duplication testing um, because that is where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck in your testing. But other disorders, um, such as familial breast and ovarian cancer, have a minority of cases that are caused by deletions or duplications. So in the case of BRCA1 and 2, we're looking at um, 10 to 15 percent of cases. Or in the case of Rett syndrome, um, on the order of about 10 percent of cases are caused by um, deletions or duplications in MECP2. So in disorders like this, 
starting with sequencing and then reflexing to deletion and to duplication testing is a more logical approach. And as I said, these are just five examples. There are many, uh, many, many more examples. Most genes do have deletions or duplications described at some level, um, but the incidence really varies depending on the gene and the disorder. Um, there are a number of different methods that are currently used um, in a clinical setting to detect lesions and duplications. I'm going to touch on um, several of the more commonly used methods right now with examples for each one um, over the next few slides. So quantitative polymerase chain reaction, or qPCR, monitors the relative um, monitors the relative amplification of a fragment of DNA over time. The information is captured in real time using fluorescent tags, which are then read um, on a, by a camera as the reaction proceeds. The key here is to detect, is to do the detection at a time when the reaction is truly quantitative before it plateaus later in the, in the reaction. And by comparing your unknowns or patient specimen to a known normal specimen run in the same reaction, you can estimate the relative copy number in your unknown. So in this case, the unknown specimen is in blue on the left, and it is about half the intensity of the, uh, the known specimen or normal specimen in red on the right. By testing multiple fractions across the gene, we can see that we are consistently seeing um, this deletion and, and get an idea of the uh, size, although that really depends on where you position your primers. In this case, you can see that all four of the fragments that have been analyzed have been, have been um, show a deletion, and this is in the BBS1 gene, which causes Bardet-Biedel syndrome. Um, so this, in, uh, this, although this confirms the presence of a deletion, it really doesn't tell us what's happening on either side. Of, these, um, of this region and how far the deletion extends. Here's an, another example. In this case, this is a duplication of the LAMA2 gene, which causes congenital muscular dystrophy. Um, and the, you can see the increased intensity of the, the duplicated specimen on the left compared to the normal on the right. But again, because we only see uh, duplications, and we don't have any fragments uh, outside that region where it's not really clear how far the duplication is to extend. Multiplex ligation dependent amplification, or MLPA, is another quantitative method that's used to detect deletions and duplications. These are commercially available kits for a variety of uh, different disorders. So MLPA is dependent on the ligation of two adjacent probes um, that contain a forward sequence and a reverse sequence uh, labeled X and Y in this slide here. Um, the, there is also a stuffer sequence usually associated with the Y, or at least in this diagram it is, with the, the Y primer. And the, the role of this stuffer sequence is to change the size of the fragments that are detected in different spots in the MLPA reaction. So the probes are annealed to the DNA side by side. There's a ligation event that creates this um, single piece. And then the forward and reverse primers, which are universal throughout the reaction, are used to amplify each of the different fragments in the reaction. These can then be run on a gel, and fragment analysis will separate all the different fragments of different sizes and quantitatively determine how many copies of each of these fragments um, is present. And again, the, the length of the stuffer sequence is what changes the size of the fragments. So 
So we can also look at this um, look at this information in a graphical format. So it will be this is normalized data where the relative amount of each fragment is normalized against several um, internal controls, which are these in green on the right-hand side of the screen, and also in control specimens that are run in the same reaction. So just to orient you to this slide, the top frame is a reference sample while the bottom frame is the test sample. Each of the data points these, any of these uh, little uh, fragments with uh, error bars represents a fragment of the gene of interest. In this case, it's the DMD gene. The error bars represent the 95% confidence interval um, for the quantification of that fragment. And as long as the fragments fall between the blue and the red uh, lines, they're considered normal. However, when they drop um, below or above this region, that can indicate a deletion or duplication. So if we look in our test sample here, we can see very clearly that there are several fragments um, that are showing a relative duplication. And this is consistent with carrier status for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, in the next slide, we again have the reference sample on the top and the test sample on the bottom. Um, in this case, the gene is uh, TSC1, which causes tuberous sclerosis, and we can quickly identify a deletion that encompasses exon 17 to 20 of the gene. As I said, there are many different commercially available kits for MLPA for a wide variety of disorders. Microarray comparative genomic hybridization, or array CGH, is a third common way that deletions and duplications are detected. In array CGH, the patient DNA is labeled with one fluorescent dye, in this case green, um, and it's mixed with uh, a reference DNA labeled with another fluorescent dye, in this case red. They're mixed together and hybridized uh, to a slide containing probes that have your region of interest, span your region of interest. Typically, the probes are spaced closer together during, in uh, coding regions and farther apart in non-coding regions just to maximize the detection of the clinically relevant deletions or duplications. If there's an equal amount of patient and control DNA, you have a one-to-one -one ratio and the spot will appear yellow. If there's more patient than control, that indicates a duplication and the spot will appear green. And if there's more of your reference sample, that suggests a deletion and the spot will appear red. Of course, all of this is done by computer, not by the eye. In the graphic at the bottom, you can see in regions where there is a, a surge in the green color, that suggests a duplication whereas a surge in the red color uh, indicates a, a deletion. One thing that's important to note about microarray is that it does not actually give you any information about the genomic organization of a deletion or a duplication. You can't tell, for example, if it's a simply a, a straight loss of material or whether it's been uh, it's a, an unbalanced translocation. More information is needed by that. So this is an example of a deletion in the GLDC gene, which causes glycine encephalopathy. To orient you to this slide, the ideogram for the chromosome is across the top. And this is chromosome uh, 9, which is the region that we're zoomed into here. In the middle, we see the distribution of probes on the microarray. Um, each green dot represents a, a distinct probe on the array. When the probes fall at or around zero, as they do in this region to the left, um, that indicates 
that it's about an equal amount of patient and um, reference DNA, but when they fall too close to the minus one level, as they do um, in the region in the center, that suggests a deletion of one copy of the gene in the patient sample. Um, and a duplication would show as a shift upwards towards the 0.5 level. So at the bottom of the slide, we can see the GLDC gene oriented from right to left with the 5' prime end um, in this area here. And in this case, exons 1 and 2, uh, represented by the small red boxes, and a large proportion of intron 2 um, have been deleted. Exon 3, which is further down, is outside the region of deletion. So because the probes are so densely spaced, we can actually get a good approximation of the size of the, um, of the deletion and the breakpoints. And up here um, in this box here in the top left, it gives us the genomic coordinates um, indicating that the deletion is approximately 52.8 kilobases. And then the last method I'm going to talk about today is next generation sequencing or NGS. So the, the term NGS is a catch-all term used to describe a number of different approaches to high throughput sequencing. The platform that we use here at Prevention Genetics is the Illumina platform, and so that's what I will base my description on, but there, be aware that there are other platforms that are widely used. So the goal of NGS is to create a vast number of short reads in a short time frame and then align these reads um, to a reference sequence. On the Illumina platform, the DNA is sheared and then adapters are attached to each end, the end of each fragment. Using these adapters, they are then annealed to the flow cell um, and PCR is carried out using a method called bridge amplification, and that's what's um, depicted in this cartoon below. Um, and this creates many different copies of the same piece of DNA, which then become the templates for your sequencing reaction. So these fragments are um, loaded into the sequencer and literally sequenced one base at a time. Um, so that it's a method called sequencing by synthesis, and one base is added at a time. The fluorescence from that base is read by the computer, and then the next base is added. And so then this creates thousands of approximately 150 base pair sequencing reads that are then aligned to the reference sequence and analyzed using the computer algorithm. So when the forward and reverse um, reads for all your fragments are aligned, you get this pile-up appearance with overlapping short fragments. And um, the forward and reverse are a different color, so the forward um, is in blue and the red is in, and the reverse is in green in these pile-ups. And you can just see that the coverage is based on the read depth or the number of times that the fragment is, um, is sequenced and also the overlapping appearance of the different fragments. And of course, although the primary goal is to sequence the region of interest at the nucleotide level with um, a high level of coverage, there are a few ways to exploit this data, uh, these data in order to see a deletion or duplication. So one of those ways is depicted in this slide. Um, although most of the fragments in the pileup align in that diagonal pattern, we see one region that has this very blunt end um, to the reads. And that suggests that what is ever beyond that point in the fragment is not aligning to the reference sequence. And therefore, that might indicate that in that region we have a deletion or a duplication. Um, one thing to be very careful about with this is, is that is to ensure your data quality is very high. If, you're, um, if you have a, a very uh, repetitive region, um, a dinucleotide or a mononucleotide repeat, you can end up with very poor uh, sequence quality, which can give you, again, that blunt end appearance. 
So it's important to take a look at the base quality scores and make sure that they're not uh, falling off at any particular point, especially at the point uh, that you're seeing this, uh, what we refer to as a cliff. So if we zoom right in, we see that there is no issue with the quality, and so this looks real. You can then take the sequence that you have in this region and query it in the, um, the BLAT tool of the UCSC Genome Browser. And what we found in this case is this 1.8 KB deletion in the BBS10 gene, um, another gene that's associated with Bardet-Bittel syndrome. And it actually, this deletion actually removes exon 2 um, through the end of the gene, uh, resulting in a severely truncated protein. So that's one way to exploit the NGS data. Another way is to simply look at um, the relative read depth of, uh, which is, uh, as I said before, the number of times a particular nucleotide or fragment is, is sequenced in your reaction. And if you have many samples in the same um, reaction, you can then sometimes see this quantitative difference um, between your sample and other samples. And so, for example, on this side, it's um, quite a high read depth, similarly on this side. But in the middle here, we start to see this pretty much half, halving of the, um, of the read depth. And that, again, can indicate that there's something going on in this region. Of course, you do have to confirm, as with any form of deletion or duplication testing, confirming with the second method is always um, the best practice. So this um, slide actually depicts a deletion in the ANC1 gene, and I'm going to discuss this case in a little greater detail um, a little bit later in the webinar. So hopefully I've given you a taste, at least, um, of some of the common methods currently used in clinical testing for deletions and duplications. Of course, with, as with any technology, there are benefits and limitations. Um, for qPCR and MLPA, these can be considered targeted methods. They're really testing for specific genes or regions, and you do need to know something about what you're looking for um, in order to do these tests um, so that you can choose your, your qPCR primers or your MLPA kit appropriately. Both methods are highly sensitive and highly specific for the region being tested, um, but only provide information about those regions. Um, the res even within the targeted area, depending on um, where your fragments sit, where your, your primers sit, you may get a lower resolution and not really have any idea of the start or end of a deletion. Um, and coverage with respect to genomic coverage is relatively um, low. Um, the turnaround time and the cost for both QPs here and MLPA are relatively low. Now, array CGH and um, NGS can be considered more genomic methods. Um, depending, of course, on your coverage, you can obtain high resolution with both of these methods um, and, and get a better idea of the start and stop of a deletion or a duplication. The main limitation with NGS at this time is that the technology is still developing at a rapid rate. Um, especially as it relates to detecting deletions and duplications. And so that data is really still accumulating, and we're not really clear on the sensitivity and specificity of NGS uh, with respect to accurate detection of deletions and duplications. Um, the cost for both array and, um, and NGS is much is higher than MLPA, qPCR, but the, if you're in analyzing a number of genes at a time, this cost per gene does come down. And the, the turnaround time, um, comparable from microarray to MLPA and qPCR, may be a little bit higher for NGS depending on um, the number of genes being analyzed. So for the rest of the webinar, I want to focus on some specific cases in which, which a deletion or duplication was really instrumental um, in solving the case. So 
So the first case um, is a nine-year-old girl who has symptoms of glycogen storage disease um, two, three, <laughs> Um, and GST3 is associated with enlargement of the liver, ketotic hypoglycemia, elevated serum transaminases and creatinine kinase, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's inherited an autosomal recessive uh, condition, and this particular form of glycogen storage disease is caused by uh, variants in the AGL gene, which is located on chromosome 1 at band P21.2. So the testing was started with a next-gen sequencing panel of 13 genes that are associated with uh, a number of GSDs, but no plausible small nucleotide variant or small insertion or deletion was detected. However, what we could see is a very clear cliff in the NGS data suggesting a possible deletion or duplication. So we, as I said, we always confirm this type of information um, with a second method. So the gene was sequenced. And what we saw is an insertion of an alu element um, in the gene. And alu elements are primate-specific repeats with a copy number well in excess of a million in the human genome, contributes about 11% of the human genome. And they're a, a type of short interspersed element or sign with wide ranging influences on the gene. So you can see that this uh, alu element, which is about 300 bases in length, is inserted right into the gene at this point. If we look at it in the other direction, we can see the insertion starting about here as well. It's a homozygous insertion, so you don't see that frame shift that we saw with the uh, indel example that we looked at a little earlier. So this is a homozygous insertion of the alu between bases um, 2871 and 2872 of the coding sequence. It does disrupt the coding sequence, um, so expect it to be uh, pathogenic, even though it was previously undocumented. Um, and this finding um, confirms the clinical diagnosis in this patient, but also allows for carrier testing um, in her family members. The next case um, is a case with a patient with a cerebral cavernous malformations. And these are vascular malformations of the brain and spinal cord comprising uh, closely clustered enlarged capillary channels known as caverns. Symptoms include seizures, focal neurological deficits, headaches, cerebral hemorrhage, um, and these typically present between the second and fifth decade of life, but up to 15% of individuals with CCM will remain symptom-free throughout their lifetime. So familial CCM is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. And there are three genes, the CRIT1, CCM2, and PDCD10. In this case, sequencing of all three of these genes was negative. And in addition, a common 77.6 kb deletion in the CCM2 gene was not present. So we moved on to a microarray test and detected this duplication of about 34.1 kb um, in the CRIT1 gene encompassing exons 8 to 18. You can see the CRIT1 gene at the bottom here, again, running from 5 prime from this end to 3 prime that end. What's really interesting about this case is that while deletions are common in CCM, duplications had only been reported um, in one other case. But because this duplication is expected to disrupt the reading frame, it's within the gene, it is expected to be pathogenic. So this result confirmed the diagnosis of a familial form of CCM in this patient and also provides the opportunity to screen unaffected family members. And those who carry the duplication could then be monitored for any signs of CCM that they uh, may have in the, in the future.
Case three is a 28-year-old woman referred for shocks-related haploinsufficiency disorder. And this disorder is characterized by short stature with a variable expressivity, variable severity. So it can include the very severe Langer mesomalic dysplasia, which is characterized by short stature with hypoplasia or aplasia, the leary wheel dyschondrosteosis, uh, which is characterized by disproportionate, disproportionate short stature with mesomelic shortening, so shortening of all four limbs, the forearms and the lower legs, and then a bilateral deformity of the wrist, and just idiopathic short stature. There's quite a bit of phenotypic variability even within families with this type with this disorder. And there is a dose dependent association between the number of copies, active copies of the shocks gene and height. So null of zygosity or complete loss of shocks will result in the more severe Langer mesomelic dysplasia, whereas haploinsufficiency can lead to either leary whale, leary wheel dyschondro or idiopathic short stature. And in fact, extra copies of this gene can is associated with a tall stature. So just a reminder that more than 70% of the pathogenic variants affecting shocks are deletions or duplications. And so the appropriate first step with this disorder is a deletion or duplication test. In this case, we, um, we did a microarray that included the shocks gene, which you can see right here, right on the left, um, just on the edge of this deletion. But in fact, the deletion actually affected um, several evolutionarily conserved non-coding elements um, that are enhancer elements for expression of shock. Um, and so this is, these are in the three prime area down here, and similar deletions encompassing these regions have been identified in indivi individuals with um, familial idiopathic familial short stature or leary, leary wheel dyschondrosteosis. So what's interesting about this case is if we had focused right in on that shocks gene uh, rather than a larger region, as is covered by the microOA, we might actually have missed this um, miss this deletion. So it just shows the importance of looking at regions both within and external to genes for potential variants. Case four is a 35-year-old woman with breast cancer, so obviously an early onset. Um, taking a look at the family history, there is a very strong family history of breast and ovarian cancer but no previous genetic testing um, in the family. And of course, there are a number of genes that are involved in hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, but two of these genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, account for 25 to 60% of breast cancer and 11 to 39% of inherited ovarian cancer. And if you have a variant in one of these genes, your lifetime risk uh, for breast cancer is 40 to 85 percent, depending on the gene and the variant, and 10 to 46 percent for ovarian cancer. So in this case, sequencing BRCA1 and BRCA2 um, did not re reveal any um, pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants. However, when we did um, microarray, we can see this duplication that affects exons 14 to 18 of BRCA2, and you can see BRCA2 here at the bottom, and the exons that are included in the duplication. So since this is a dominant, these are dominant disorders, this does confirm the diagnosis of a hereditary form of breast cancer in this patient. It can allow this patient to consider risk-reducing therapies, such as a mastectomy or oophorectomy. It can also um, allow her to consider increased surveillance for a recurrence, and then it allows for pre-symptomatic testing in her at-risk family members with anyone who's carrying this variant <clears throat> being able to also consider um, increased surveillance or risk-reducing therapies, depending on their choice. 
Case five is an eight-year-old boy with symptoms of hereditary spherocytosis. Um, this disorder is characterized by hemolytic anemia, jaundice, and enlarged spleen, and gallstones. It is a genetically and clinically heterogeneous um, disorder, and variants in five genes that you can see listed there have been associated with the disorder. Most of the cases, about 75%, are autosomal dominant, but autosomal recessive and de novo cases have been described. In this case, we didn't see any plausible single nucleotide or small uh, variants or single small insertions and deletions on sequencing, but this is the case that I showed you before where on NGS we see this decrease in the read depth um, across exons 17 to 24 of ANC1. Um, and so this, this information was then taken and uh, qPCR was performed in order to confirm the presence of this deletion and the, the size of it, and it did confirm, indeed confirm the exon 17 to 24 were deleted. So this confirms the diagnosis of a hereditary form of spherocytosis in this child and also allows for family testing if desired. And the last case um, that I wanted to talk to you about is this case of a two-year-old girl referred to, to very high cholesterol and xanthomas. So this little girl's total cholesterol was 853 um, milligrams per deciliter. Just for reference, the normal range for total cholesterol is less than 200. Her LDL was at 773, with the normal range being less than 130, and her HDL was at 34, which the normal range, with the normal range being 40 to 59. Um, there was a very strong family history, actually, on both sides of the family of high cholesterol and instances of early cardiac death. So familial hypercholesterolemia um, is a disorder that is characterized by severely elevated LDL, which we see in this patient, arthrosclerotic path deposition in the arteries, a markedly increased risk for coronary artery disease, and then cholesterol dep deposits in the tendons, which is called xanthomas, or around the eyes, which are called xanthelasma. This disorder can be inherited either in a heterozygous or a homozygous form. Both forms are dominant, but the heterozygous form is more common, and the homozygous form has a much earlier onset. So there are three, gene, three genes associated with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, um, LDLR, ApoB, and PKSK9. Heterozygous um, FH is, can, can often be directly attributed to a pathogenic variant, single pathogenic variant in one of these three genes. Um, and they account for, these three genes account for 60 to 80% of cases. So individuals uh, with untreated heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia at or at, are at an approximately 20-fold increase for coronary artery disease. Um, untreated men are at, risk, at a 50% risk for a fatal or non-fatal coronary event by age 50, and untreated women are at about a 30% risk um, of a coronary event by age 60. In contrast, the homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia results from either biallelic um, pathogenic variants in one of the known genes or two different pathogenic, two pathogenic variants in two different of the genes. Most individuals with the homozygous form of the disorder experience coronary artery disease, severe coronary artery disease by their mid-20s, and the rate of either death or coronary bypass surgery by teenage years is actually very high. 
uh, with severe aortic stenosis also being very common. So in this child, uh, we did sequence um, the three genes associated with um, familial hypercholesterolemia and we found this truncating variant in LDLR, um, which confirmed a diagnosis of, of familial hypercholesterolemia. But it's at the end of the story. Remember that the very early age of onset for this child, plus the history on both sides of the family. So we had went ahead and did a microarray as well and found this 25.5 KB duplication, uh, again within LDLR, encompassing exons 2 to 12. Um, and we then did PCR and sequencing across these breakpoints, confirming that there were two copies of exons 2 to 12 um, in a tandem orientation. And this is predicted to disrupt the open reading frame and leading, lead to a premier, premature termination due to a frame shift um, in the protein. So in fact, this child is a compound heterozygote, which confirms her, her more severe phenotype, her early age of onset. It also means that both sides of her, van, her family are at risk for familial hypercholesterolemia, and par parental testing did confirm that both parents are carriers of one of these pathogenic variants each. Um, so hopefully, through these case reports, I've, I've helped, I've convinced you that deletion and duplication testing is useful and important, um, given you a taste of the different methods that might be used to detect this type of rearrangement. Um, and that the type of testing does provide clinically valid information beyond direct sequencing. Um, in some cases, it actually makes sense to start with deletion or duplication testing. And that the results can have clinical utility both for the patient themselves and for their families. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and ask for any questions. Okay. Thank you very much for an informative presentation. We do have a couple of uh, questions here, which I will try to, that have been passed to me and I'll try to represent. Uh, and if I need help, I'll just have the uh, questioners come up to the microphone. Uh, the first question is, what advice would you give a clinician testing for a disorder that is so rare that it isn't clear which variants, del dupes versus point mutations indels, are more commonly responsible for the disease? Where would you start with testing, sequential testing or all at once? I think um, in most cases we're going to do a sequential test. And in most cases, even when the disorder is rare, we do have a hint as to what might be more common. And, and certainly um, often we start with a, an NGS panel or another sequencing panel. Um, obviously in those cases where deletions or duplications are very common, we'd start with that. But certainly sequential testing makes the most sense because you may get an answer from the first test. Of course, there's, um, there's um, the possibility that you will have to go to the second one anyways, but. <laughs> okay, and then the next question is, do clinicians actually know which they'll do tests to order or does your lab decide on the method? Um, well, we don't decide, but we will certainly advise. So um, if, if a, an order comes in and we think that maybe the approach would be um, better to be concurrent or um, start with del dupes versus sequencing, we certainly will um, discuss that with the referring doc to say, okay, how do we, how would you like to approach this? There's also quite a lot of information on our website about these different tests and disorders that can give you some guidance as to where to start. Uh, we have a follow-up to the previous question, which is in the case where the disease is so rare that it hasn't, a del dupe hasn't been described, um, w would you actually do del dupe anyway, looking for a new disease, or do you consider that research? We would, this is we asked would, by a person. Yeah, this is asked by a person related to feeling that some of the docs are really getting towards the research end, and maybe <laughs> should have the patients build, have their insurance build, or have to pay out of pocket. So that's super <laughs> double interesting question. 
Um, so certainly you want to have some evidence of um, that you've seen this kind of rearrangement before even in even a lab investing in developing the test um, and and um, as I said we certainly will advise as to what what the most logical and cost-effective approach would be to in in any disorder sometimes as yeah. you say if it's such a rare disorder um, there may not even be a clinical test available for it in which case, yeah. you know, you are, you are um, talking about research in that case. Um, next question, it seems that, that literature suggests that the methods in general have become more reliable so that confirmatory testing is not required. What is your current take on this? Currently, we confirm um, every positive result that we get, and, and that's just, in, in some cases, it's to refine um, the area and give a better idea of the breakpoints, and in some cases, just to, to give us a, a extra um, assurance that what we're seeing by one method is, is uh, validated by another. And that I think yeah. that's pretty standard in most clinical labs. I think we, most clinical labs will validate uh, an abnormal result uh, with a second method. Yeah. What, uh, what is your, the last question, as because we're running out of time, is what uh, is your uh, beliefs regarding current trends in Beldu testing? What do you think is going to, what, what are things going to look like technically five years from now? Um, I think that we will go much more to um, the sequencing technology. Now, the, the um, so the NGS says we're starting to see that emerging as a reliable method for detecting deletions and duplications. As I mentioned, we this is still very much a um, evolving field. The technology is evolving at a rapid rate. Um, our computer algorithms for analyzing these data are evolving rapidly. But I do think that we are going to go to more um, sequence-based methods, such as, as NGS, um, as we go forward. So more, more cost-effective and more rapid methods. That's great. We have one last question. I said, I said that was the last question, but I lied because another question okay. came in and we have time for it. It's a specific question about one of your cases. It says, was there any evidence of the LDLR dupe by sequencing, and if not, why? So uh, there wasn't, and it was because it was a Sanger um, sequencing um, test, and uh, in Sanger, as I touched on very briefly, we're just looking at a very small region. We don't see anything about breakpoints unless your sequencing primers happen to be on either side of the breakpoint. So in the sequencing test, when there's a deletion or duplication of a region, it means you're really only sequencing one, one strand in that case in, mm -hmm. uh, in the Sanger. In the NGS, because it's a more um, uh, genomic approach to the sequence, sometimes you can see those cliffs or the difference in uh, read depth that give you a, a clue that there's something there, but don't necessarily, yeah. but you have to follow that up. Got it. I want to thank Dr. Allingham Hawkins, Laboratory Director of Prevention Genetics, for giving us a terrific, terrific presentation today. I want to thank our crowd here at the Antichrist Boardroom for their questions and their attention. And I want to thank our uh, crowd nationally who appeared to us through Medical Training Solutions. It was nice to have a big uh, turnout for the webinar. I'd like to uh, just mention in, in closing the uh, upcoming webinars in our Seattle Children's Hospital webinar series on May 17th at 11 a.m. Pacific time, which is 2 p.m. Eastern time and also 1 o'clock Central time. We'll be talking about compelling laboratory test utilization management case studies and results. Presenters will be Jesse Conta, Head Lab Genetic Counselor at Seattle Children's, Shannon Stasi, also from Seattle Children's, one of our lead genetic counselors, and Cheryl Hess, a genetic counselor from NextGXDX. Then on June 28th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, we will have a panel of experts who will present the latest on clinical exome sequencing and interpretation. I'm sure a lot of the people who attended today will be interested in that session. Presenters will be John Thompson, Dr. Thompson's Chief Technology Officer at Clark House Genomics, Natalie Vina, a genetic, a genetic counselor, Claritas, Dave Miller, medical director, associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Thanks and have a great day.